In this video, I'm going to show you how to build this 3D printer enclosure for $300. Let's go! But why would you want to build it in the first place? FDM printers produce a lot of plastic particles, and those are not good for anybody's health. Also, opening the window is not always the best solution. Today, we are going to look at how to build this to get rid of fumes, and also how to make the HEPA filter so you can print without the plastic smell in your living room. Word of warning though, this enclosure is a bit DIY heavy. So in order to build it, you have to be quite capable with DIY skills. You will need a bunch of tools, including circular saw, drill and reciprocating saw. I don't have any of those tools, so I borrowed most of it. The electronics part is quite difficult as well. You will need a lot of electronic equipment and a soldering iron to do it. I borrowed that also. Yeah, most of this was borrowed, by the way. Yeah, well, I don't have infinite money. Polycarbonate is really expensive. It's like half the price of the complete enclosure. Seriously, like $150. <laughs> Most of the plastic components are printed, so you will need a 3D printer to make this enclosure. But I guess you would have a 3D printer if you are trying to build a 3D printer enclosure, right? Anyway, get the printer first. Okay. Step one, go to GrabCAD, download the files needed for this enclosure. Download the models and the technical drawings. The 3D is available in Fusion 360 format or Step 5. I created drawings for the assembly, the HEPA filter assembly and the components. You can also find cutting and drilling templates and the instructions for all of the sheets. Step 2. Cut the polycarbonate. For this you will need a sheet of 2050mm by 1250mm. That's big. The sheet needs to be 5mm thick and you will need to cut it with a circular saw. You will definitely need the linear guide. Don't just freehand it. It's not going to work. You will need pretty much perfectly straight cuts. If you take a look at the cutting template, all dimensions are measured from two sides. This is not an accident. This is done to minimize any errors coming from the size of the sheet. Keep that in mind. Always use only two sides for measurement. Once that is complete, you can cut. Cut these two lines first. and then separate the plates. Cutting the top panel is much easier, but try to stick with the dimensions. Make it as accurate as possible. Step 3. When all that is done, you will need to mark the polycarbonate sheets for drilling. This is also a possible place for error, so be very careful. Measure twice, drill once. I learned that the hard way, okay? You should drill with a 4mm drill. The whole assembly is compensated in some ways for inaccuracies, so there is a bit of a loud tolerance, let's just say. Plus minus 1mm in position is not that big of a deal. However, try to be as precise as possible, it's gonna matter later on. In the cutting template, the sides used as zero position are not just used in the cutting template as zero position, but in the assembly as well. So if you look at the corner, you can see that the sheets are overlapped and they are overlapped in a way where the zero points are actually in contact with another sheet. So this is why it's important to make those accurate, because those will define the shape. For the big round hole, use a 60mm circle cutter attachment for a drill. For the rectangular hole, use a 10mm drill to drill the corners and then cut the straight lines with the jigsaw. Step 4. Once all the cutting and drilling is done and you know it's going to work and you've double checked the dimensions, then you can get to printing. The components you print ideally should be made from PEG with 4 perimeters and 20% infill. Keep in mind that PEG is much better suited for this kind of application than PLA. It's because it has better temperature resistance and better flexibility. All the components can be printed without supports and if your slicer is suggesting supports then you are doing it wrong. With components where the orientation on the build plate is questionable, I added some arrows. The arrows always need to point upwards. The corners 
take the most time. That's because they are very big components. Prusa Mini like this can fit four on the beer plate. However, I would suggest for first time print only one and check the results. Stringing is not that big of a problem. That's the usual deal with Peggy. And anyway, it doesn't really constitute too much in the end. You can always just send it down. I would suggest to keep the temperatures high, even if you get stringing, because layer adhesion is going to be much more important for integrity than stringing. So the order I would suggest to print a single part is test, then if that works, print four and then three in the end. The small corners and all the other components print much quicker, except the HEPA filter stuff, because those are quite long prints. A roll of 1 kg PEGI should be completely enough for the whole assembly, even with reprints. There's a very important thing you need to keep in mind in regards to printing, which is that your combination of printer, filament and slicer can somewhat affect how the filament is extruded. In a way, holes I designed to be a certain size can be different on your print in real life. And if that happens, you can always compensate for that. Just print a few samples of the parts, print one sample of the parts, measure what dimensions are not okay, and then just adjust those in Fusion. Since I uploaded the files as CAD files, you can always change the dimensions if one hole doesn't align. I would call this uh, size calibration based on actual print. Step 5. The HEPA filter assembly is arguably the most important part of this enclosure. So how does it work? This assembly consists of a 12 volt DC blower, PVM module, a HEPA filter, an activated carbon filter, 3D printed seals, screws, 3D printed components to hold the whole thing together, and a 12 volt DC jack for 12 volt input. The concept is very simple. 12 volt blower sucks air through the two filters out of the enclosure, creating a low pressure inside. This makes sure that no particles escape the enclosure. Because of the low pressure, fresh air is drawn through openings in the front. It is also a way to adjust the temperatures. If you open the door partially and lock it in place, that will allow you to maintain a sub 40 degree temperature inside the enclosure. I did this because this was the simplest option instead of cutting additional holes. Also, this is adjustable. And my 3D printer is not rated to operate above 40 degrees centigrade. Yeah, that's a bummer, but I learned it too late, so I had to do something about it. When I do this, I usually run the blower at around 70%. That gives it quite good airflow. If you put your hand on the opening, you can still feel the air being sucked in. So there is a draft. Of course, you can use it close, but the temperatures you will get will be much higher. That's a good thing. Now I know your question, but Daniel, why did you choose a centrifugal blower instead of a fan? For example, an Octua fan from a PC case. That seems to be cheaper. Or well, not cheaper, but more widely available. Well, that's very simple. Axial fans provide a high volume flow of air at the cost of noise and low pressure. But here, we are trying to suck air through a filter with low noise and high pressure. So technically, a centrifugal blower just seems like a much better choice. You see, you don't need to exchange the air inside the enclosure every one minute, unlike in a PC case. Here, you just need to extract a small volume of air to make sure that the negative pressure difference is maintained. It's not that fans cannot produce a negative pressure because they most certainly can do, but you need to run them much harder. And to that end, a blower seems like a more civilized option because you might want to leave this machine running at night, right? If you have a 12 hour print, I'm sure you don't want to listen to the fan running at 100% all day or night, right? Incidentally, the mounting of this filter assembly is the exact same size as the mounting holes for a 120 mm fan. Keep that in mind. If you have a fan and the noise is annoying you, you can still change it. At around 70 to 100%, it's still decently quiet, even at full power. The factory noise rating is also not bad. I'm not sure if I believe it though, but it's very good. I haven't actually measured it because I haven't got a noise meter, so yeah. Because I do not know the type of this PVM module because it was just the cheapest I could find, I cannot exactly help you to find the exact same module, so you will maybe have to adjust the fixation holes on the top cover. But you can do that in Fusion or any other CAD program that you see fit. Conclusions. 
this enclosure is self-supporting so it doesn't need any frame that's the special thing about it it is a trade-off as all things are because had i not built it from this thick polycarbonate and had it not been self-supporting it might have been cheaper but that doesn't look as cool. These kind of 3D printer enclosures are usually made out of two lock tables. Those are cheaper because the polycarbonate is much smaller in area and much smaller in width. And that makes it cheaper. However, these are not really rigid and it's not really my favorite solution. Even so, I used it as a base for the enclosure, which I sort of regret. For me, the stability of the lock table is... Well, it leaves some things to be desired. It's also made from hollow materials, which is fine, but it amplifies the vibrations of the 3D printer. So in a way, it acts like a sort of loudspeaker for any 3D printer, and that's not good. You need to somehow isolate them. Even the Prusa Mini, which is quite silent as far as 3D printers go, can be very obnoxiously loud without some sort of dampening. So I actually keep a wall tile under the 3D printer with some additional vibration insulation so I don't get that much noise. That is how loud it can be. So in conclusion, if I did this a second time, I would... I'm not sure I would use a lock table for the base. It's like a couple dollars in price and it's not very expensive and it is not very good to be honest. However, it is the ideal size, so it was easier to do it this way. With more time and more money, I could have come up with something better, but it's fine for now. That way you will get the, uh, the ideal stock ships. <laughs>